Hey, what's up? Good morning, Discovery Church. How many of you are recognized with me that God is here? How many of you recognize that today, that man, the Spirit of God is here? This is something I think that that is easy to forget. Those of you who are regular attenders of church, it just gets so easy to become routine just to come in Sunday morning and forget that God is here, and, he's, and He wants to change your life. He, he actually has, he has a purpose for you today, like you need the touch of God today. How many of you agree with that? You need, you need the touch of God today, amen? Amen. It just, let's, let's posture our heart that way, because God is here, I'm telling you, I can sense his presence and his power. We're in this series called God's Way Works. God's Way Works. And, and a lot of you here today would agree with that. Like you, you agree with that statement that his way works. Some of you might not agree with that today, and that's okay. Like maybe you're not sure. That's all good. We're so glad that you are here. But a lot of you probably would agree with that. But there's, we, even though we agree with it, we don't apply his ways to our life um, all the time. And so, so yes, you know, like, I know your will is good and your way is great, but I'd rather you not be involved in this area of my life. And, and for every single person here, it may be a different area for you, but every one of you have different issues, different habits and hangups that you would rather God's ways not kind of infiltrate or, or, or take over that area of your life. So in this series, what we're doing is we're talking about one of those areas of our life that tends to, we tend to stiff arm God and, and not allow his ways in, and that's the area of our finances. Um, so everyone agrees that God's ways work, and his, his, the Bible is full of principles, uh, uh, financial principles, that, that is supposed to produce blessing and favor in our lives if we apply them. But for many of us, we'd rather God not step into that area of our life. And I just want to put you at ease today. If you're kind of new, we're not taking up any special offering, anything like that today. We don't want your money. There'll be a time at the end of the service to, to freely give as you want to give. But, but honestly, these, these principles are for you. They're, they're, and, and so the question then becomes like, what would that look like if we were to invite God into that area of our life? What would it look like if we invited God into the decision-making and planning process of our finances? Look, you'll discover like, like God's way works. Like you will have a better, more fruitful life with Christ in this area, in this sphere that maybe you've, whether it's ignorant or stiff army, whatever, but if you invite God's way into this part of your life, I promise you, you're going to see that God's way works and it will produce blessing and favor inside of your life. So last week we laid the foundation in this whole, you know, uh, this idea of financial management. And what we kind of discovered together is financial management is a spiritual discipline. It is, it is a spiritual discipline. You, you, you cannot kind of, kind of categorize and, 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 and put God in certain parts of your life and not have him in, in others, which a lot of times we have the tendency to do. But a financial management is a spiritual discipline, and it takes spiritual maturity. So we laid the foundation last week with this idea of stewardship. And everything in this four-week series, we got today and two more to talk about, everything that, that I am bringing now from this point forward needs that foundation of stewardship. Like you, if you don't have this, this understanding of what, it, what does it mean to be a steward, then nothing else God says will make sense about, your, about the finances, okay? So if you miss that, you need to go check that out. If you really want to investigate God's ways here into your life, in this area of your life, you need to go check out part one about stewardship, where we talked about the seven principles of stewardship. And, and, and really what we discovered is that God is the owner of everything, and I don't own a thing. Like, we don't own anything. We're just stewards of them. Managers are caretakers of the things that God has blessed us and provided for us. Now, if last week was like the foundation, this week, today, is the frame. It's, it's the framework. It's what contains. It's what holds it together. It's what gives it structure and stability. Today, we're talking about contentment. Contentment. And again, with both these, the foundation and the frame, you really cannot get the next two weeks uh, that I'm going to be sharing with you. That is really some great principles of blessing and favor in your life when you apply them. You can't really produce that unless you have the foundation and unless you have the frame. So we're, today we're going to talk about these laws 
of contentment. And I'm telling you, this message comes at a very, very timely season of our life. It really does. We're in what's, what some people call the season of discontent, or some of you may know it as Christmas time, okay? This Christmas season, the holiday season. And I'm telling you, just we are the most discontent now than, than the, the rest of the year. You know why? I'll tell you why. Because these marketers have been strategizing all year. They've been strategizing. And some of them actually go to this church, okay? I'm not going to tell you who they are, but these marketers, they have the, they're strategizing all year to, to, for these last 60 days. This whole year, they've been strategizing to get, the, and this, this is their goal. They, they want to get what's in your pocket in their pocket. That's the whole goal, I'm telling you. And so they, they come up with a good plan of, of, of how to do that. And, and so your mailboxes are going to be littered with catalogs and advertisements over the next 60 days. Your email inbox is going to get full with ads and caver, ad, ad, catalogs and advertisements. Can I tell you something? As your pastor who loves you, who cares about you deeply, let me just tell you very bluntly, okay? Catalogs are of the devil, all right? They just, because... <laughs> Because you look at that thing, and then you just become so discontent. Like, like I need this. This is, this is, how did I ever live without this? This is what I need. This will make my life better. It'll make, well, how, did I, how did I get by without this? I'm telling you, this message today comes in a very timely season of your life that we need to learn this principle. If you want to invite God's way in and, be, and, and operate by God, you got to learn the law of contentment. Let me give you a few scriptures to kick this off. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 30. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a lot of Proverbs and Ecclesiastes verses in this message because that's the wisdom literature written by Solomon, the wisest person to ever live, one of the richest people that ever lived. So he has a lot to say, some experience about this topic. All right, so we're going we're gonna to learn a lot from Proverbs and Ecclesiastes today. Here's what he says in verse 30 of chapter 14. He says, it's healthy to be content but envy will eat you up. And there it is again, that feedback coming. I'm not sure how it, how it happened, but it's coming back at me again. He's saying it's not only financially good um, for you to be content, but it's actually physically good for you to be contented in life. Like it's invigorating. To be content brings health and peace. Instead of being all tense and stressed and worried all the time, this desire to always have more will eat you alive, is what he's saying. And when it comes to your health, it's not just what you eat that matters, it's what eats you. Look at this one, Ecclesiastes 6 and 9. It is better to be satisfied with what you have than to always wanting something else. And that right there is the principle. This is the law of contentment. It's better to be satisfied with what you have than to always be wanting something else. I can't think of a more timely subject than this one right here, you guys. And so because it's the season and because there's a scheme and a strategy against you and your finances right now, we're going to, this message, I want to bring you something to counter that, okay? Uh, the Bible says that there are some effects of always wanting more. There's some very damaging effects of living your life of always wanting more. And you may see this already playing out in your life. Some of these damaging effects maybe already manifesting in your life or maybe in your, in, in your relationship with your spouse or maybe you see them already manifesting in your children, some of these damaging effects of always wanting more. This is so important with this, in, this, in this topic, you guys. Write some notes with me. Follow along, you guys. Here they are. The five damaging effects of always wanting more. Number one is more fatigue. More fatigue. You're going to be more tired, always wanting more, working harder. Um, that's kind of tiredness and just this exhaustion is in effect of just overworking for more. Uh, Leo Tolstoy told this story. He wrote a story a hundred years ago. He told the story of a peasant and his master. And, and this master um, owned this great, vast property and lands. Just so much. And he told, this, he told this peasant, he said, hey, I'll give you as much land as you can walk on in 24 hours in one day. You can have it all. So, so this peasant gets so excited. He just runs, runs, runs. He's just running all over the, the place and trying to get as much land as he can. And what ends up happening, at the end of the day, he dies of exhaustion. And I'm, and I'm telling you, literally, you guys, listen, we are dying, you know, uh, of exhaustion, you know, for things, we're running after things. That's the first thing you'll see is more fatigue. 
Proverbs chapter 23, verse 4 says, Do not wear yourself out to be rich. Have the wisdom to show restraint. Um, he says, it's, this is dumb. He says, it's, it's stupid. It's foolish to wear yourself out to get more things. Even if you win the rat race, listen, you're still a rat, okay? It's, it's more fatigue. Here's, a, here's the second thing. Write it down. More expense. More expense. You didn't know that, did you? It always costs more to have more. It does. It's going to cost you more to have more. It brings a greater expense. I always say if the grass is greener on the other side, then the water bill is higher. Okay? Someone's paying for that green over there. Ecclesiastes 5.11 says, The more you have, the more people come to help you spend it. Isn't that true? The money that you have, all, the, all of a sudden you need an accountant, you need a housekeeper, you need someone to mow the lawn. You, you, the more money you have, the more money that you have to spend, and you, the more people will come along to help you spend it. So he says, so what's the advantage of wealth except perhaps to watch it run through your fingers? I saw a bump, bumper sticker a while back that said, I used to dream of the salary I'm now starving on. And that's, that's not even funny. That's serious, you know. We used to dream of getting that promotion and getting that salary so we can make ends meet. And then all of a sudden, we finally get it and someone moved the end. It's like, dang it, it got further away. It's this race for more is going to just produce more expenses. You say, oh, but I got to keep up with the Joneses. Don't keep up with the Joneses. The Joneses filed bankruptcy, okay? The Joneses got a divorce. That's what happened. Don't follow the Joneses. Follow godly principles that will produce life and blessing, okay? That's what we need to do. And we think the problem is we don't make enough. But the truth is we want too much. That's the real problem. We want too much. So it brings frustration. It brings fatigue. It brings expenses. Here's another one. It brings more anxiety. It brings more anxiety. The more you have, the more you worry about. Yeah, the more you have, the more you worry about. Can I tell you, like, I, I don't... I don't lose any sleep. I don't worry at all about my yacht getting barnacles on its undercarriage. I don't. You know why? I don't have a yacht. That's why. Okay? Because when you have it, you have more things. Now, now I have to, you know, maintain it, repair it, you know, fix it. You, you got to pay taxes on it. I got to store it. I got to do all those, all those different things. Um, and, and, and we have so many things now that you can't even store them in your house. You, you buy another place to store your things that you don't have, that you don't use often, and you don't have enough room in your house. Where's the logic in that? that? That, oh my goodness, like we, that we have an accumulation of things, and what happens is that produces more anxiety. Ecclesiastes 5.12 says, A working man can get a good night's sleep, but the rich man has so much that he stays awake worrying. He's worried about how to save it, how to invest it, how to maintain it, insure it, avoid taxes on it. I read a study recently that said that insomnia increases with income. Go figure that, okay? The more, the more you make, the more you have, the more stressed out and the more sleepless nights you have. So um, if you have more fatigue, more expenses, plus more anxiety, you know what else that equals? Here, write this down, more conflict, okay? Mo money, mo problems. That's what that, ha that's what that equals, okay? You're going to have more conflict in your home because of these things. And I know, I get it. Like some of you really are trying to just give your family or your kids something that you never gave. And you're just trying to go more and more and more. And you even see it now. It's producing turmoil in your house, in your kids, just these attitudes and conflicts. Like it's this, this what you thought that you were giving that was supposed to be a blessing is actually causing turmoil in your life and family. Look at Proverbs 15 to 27. says just that. A greedy man brings trouble to his family. And we, we, we know that today, that the number one cause of divorce is financial tension. Every study shows it. It's not till death do us part. It's till debt do us part. That's what it is. 1 Timothy 6, 9 says, People who long to get rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many foolish and harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. What's he talking about there? He's talking about debt. He's talking about financial ruin and destruction. People who are always discontent are always looking for more. Got to have more. It produces more conflict. And lastly, what really it produces, you guys, is more dissatisfaction. We, we thought 
that having more will make us more happy, that having more will make us more secure, will make us more important, that would make us more loved maybe, but none of that is true. It actually produces the opposite, more, disfat- more dissatisfaction. I mean, it's true that you can buy happiness for the short term, yeah, but that is very short-lived. It doesn't last long. Yeah, you can go out and buy a brand new car. You're going to be happy, man. You're going to be thrilled about that new car. You're going to get in there, that new car smell. Who doesn't love that? Man, it smells good. But if you got kids, that lasts all but two weeks, okay? And, and, and then right when you drive it off the, the lot, check it out, you just lost $10,000 because it's not new anymore. Just like that, it depreciated, okay? It produces more dissatisfaction. Ecclesiastes 5.10 says, if you love money, and we talked about that last week, remember, money is a tool. You use money, and you love people. If you start loving money, you're going to use people to get more money. You're going to get it twisted. Money is not to be loved. He says, if you love money, you'll never be satisfied. If you long to be rich, you'll never get all you want. It is useless. Someone asked a wealthy man one time, he said, hey, what is it? Well, how much does it take for a man to be happy? And he said, just a little bit more. I said, oh, just, just a little bit more. If I, could just, if I could just get a little bit more and it's useless, he says, you'll never be satisfied. So let me ask you a question, gut level honesty here. How many of you would say that you would like to live a life of less fatigue, less expenses, less anxiety, less conflict, less dissatisfaction? How many of you would like to live that kind of life here? Come on. Yeah, yeah, every one of us wants to live that. So here's, here's the thing then. We need to learn the secret of contentment. If you want to live this, this kind of life that is less of all this more going on and this, these damaging effects are producing, pr- produced in our life, then we need to learn the secret of contentment. Look at Philippians chapter 4, verse 12. It actually says that. He says, Paul, the author here, he says, I have learned. You see, this is something you can learn. You have learned to be discontent. You have learned some things. You've been conditioned to want more, to go after more, to be dissatisfied. You have picked up on some things that this world has deposited. You've learned some things, but the Bible says, no, you can unlearn that. You can learn something new. I have, Paul says, I have learned the secret of being content. See, it's a secret. I'm going to show you the secret. Like, like it's, it, you're going to have to learn this secret of contentment, whether living in plenty or in want. And see, by nature, we are not contented people. Humans, we are not by nature contented people. We are always wanting more. We're wanting things to change. We're wanting something different. We're wanting something better. We want the upgrade. We want it. We want it. We want it. We're, we, this is very countercultural, and it doesn't come automatic. So how then? How do I learn the secret of contentment, and invite God's way, because look at, man, in our lives, it's producing this damaging effects. We've tried it the world's way, we, we, and we see the effects of it, but look, man, if God's ways work, and they do, why don't we just kind of invite his word and his way into our life, and let's see what kind of effects that they can have. What does that look like? The secret of contentment. The Bible tells us there are four steps. There are four keys. There are four principles to the secret of contentment. I want you to write them down today. And this is, this is so, it's not just foundational. This is like the frame of, of, your, of, your, of everything that we are going to discuss for the next couple of weeks here, okay? What is it? Here, write some notes, you guys. Number one, here's the first step, the first key. And that is to stop comparing myself to others. Stop comparing myself to others. That's the first step in becoming a contented person you gotta stop it stop it stop it stop it stop comparing yourselves god made you unique god made you um different god made you there is no one else like you at all ever that will be created stop comparing yourself to others second corinthians 10 12 says it this way he says we do not dare he says how dare you do this it's a rejection of god when you start comparing yourself to others because god made you unique how dare you do this we do not dare classify or compare ourselves it is not wise he says it's foolish man this is dumb it's immature and the problem is we naturally do this we do it all the time okay this is america's favorite indoor sport comparison 
Absolutely. You walk into a house and you start, that's what you do, right? When you walk into that house, you go, oh, that's a nice floor. Look at that floor. That's a nice floor. Oh, is that the new TV right there? Is that the, that's nice TV, man. Oh, look at the drapery. Isn't the drapery so? And we're just making comparisons uh, all the time we're doing it. Oh, man, I wish I had, you know, their kids. I wish I had her husband. I wish I had her, you know, wife, his wife. I wish I had. And we're making these comparisons, and that's what's keeping you frustrated and discontent. You got to stop it. If you're going to learn contentment, you got to stop comparing yourself to everything around you. You have to learn how to admire without acquiring. All right? That's, that's a secret to contentment. You have to learn how to admire without the need to acquire you know you don't have to own it to enjoy it okay you don't have to have it you're like some of you like oh i love jet skiing oh jet skiing so fun so what i'm gonna do i'm gonna go buy you know everyone in the family a jet ski and now what do i gotta do now i gotta store it now i gotta maintain it and repair it and all that and I, I i made an invest now you know when we're out there in a jet skis five years from now and someone else is riding the new model guess what you do you gotta upgrade it don't you i want that one that one's better now and so you don't have to own it to enjoy it, just go rent those. You, you, and then you're storing it. You use it twice a year, okay? Twice a year. Some of you are like, oh, I love the mountains. Oh, man, the mountains are beautiful. You know, I'm, I'm buying a house in the mountains. That is the, come on, man. Now you got to furnish it. You got to insure it. You got to pay taxes on it, all that. Like, like, I don't, like, I don't need to own it to enjoy it. I'll just enjoy what you bought, okay? I'll go rent that thing one time a year, and I'm good, okay? You don't have to. That's a, like, like, that's a trap, I'm telling you. Exodus, now, it's not only good financially, like good financial management principle for you to stop comparing, all right? But this is actually so important to God, he calls it a sin. Did, did, you, know, did you know that this, this makes it into the Ten Commandments? Yeah, comparing yourself with others. It's right up there with do not murder. And none of you would think of doing that. Don't commit adultery. You know what the Tenth Commandment is? Don't compare yourself to others. Look at it, Exodus chapter 20, verse 17. You shall not covet anything that belongs to your neighbor. Don't go, oh, look at that. I wish I had that. Coveting, what is that word? It's an older word, but what does that mean? It means this uncontrolled desire to acquire. That's that there. The Hebrew word literally means um, to pant after. You're literally tongue out salivating over it. The Greek, in the Greek, it means to grasp tightly. Like, man, I can't, like, this is mine. It's to grasp it tightly. Listen, if God gave you something, and then God tells you to let it go or give it to someone else, and you can't obey God, you're, you don't own it. It owns you. You don't possess it. It's possessing you. God says, don't covet. And I want to make something really clear here, because God's not saying you should not have the desire for anything. That's not what God's saying. God's like, God's not saying, oh, just don't desire. Just, just that's not, that's not Christianity. That's Buddhism. You know that? That's the uh, Buddha, the whole, the whole premise, the idea and the goal of Buddhism. Here's, here's the thing. B Buddhists believe and the Buddhist uh, philosophy is that all pain and suffering come from desire. That's, 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 that's their premise. It's like, if I, so if I can just get rid of my desires, I'll never experience pain. If I could just get rid of my desires, I'll never experience suffering. So, so they, they call this place, that place of when you have, when you're removed of all desires, they call it nirvana. Okay, nirvana isn't the place of pleasure. It's not a pleasurable place. Nirvana is a place, it literally means nothingness. It is, it is the place of, of that you have arrived, like I have no desires anymore in life. No desires at all, so nothing can ever hurt me. I cannot suffer. I cannot have pain because I have no desires. Can I tell you something? That is nonsense. It is complete nonsense. Anything great that has ever been accomplished in the world are for God. Started with a desire. Started with God giving a weighty burden and a vision to do something great. You can't even become like Christ unless you desire to become like Christ. Okay, God has given you, you have desires that God has given you that are pure and holy and that can propel you into moving towards your destiny, okay? So you get married, the only reason why you get married is because you desire to get married. The only reason why you have kids is because you desire to have children to leave a legacy. Look, desires aren't wrong, 
Okay, in fact, God does. He'll give you desires. We're not talking about desires being evil. It's the uncontrolled desire that'll get you in trouble. Uncontrolled desire becomes lust. Uncontrolled desire becomes coveting. That's what happens. So never compare. The first key to learning the secret of contented life, never compare. Why? Because comparing will always lead to coveting. Here's the second secret. Write it down, and that is to enjoy what I have. I need to learn how to, yes, this is a secret of contentment, to learn how to enjoy what I have. Too often we're so busy going after what else, what next, that we don't stop and enjoy what I've already got. How many of you know people that overextended themselves and bought a house that they could not afford, and now they can't even enjoy the house? They're not even there in the house. So, so living rooms sit unlived in and pools sit unswimmed in because they're just trying to pay for it or even trying to get more and more and more. The, the second principle, the secret of contentment is to learn to enjoy what God has given you. Look at Ecclesiastes 5 and 10. If God gives a man wealth and property, which we found out last week, God does do that. It is all his. When, if God gives you wealth and property, he should g- be grateful and enjoy what he has. It is a gift from God. See, this is a command. I am commanded to enjoy what God gives. You need to pay more attention to what you have and, and, and open your eyes and appreciate what God has already given you. You need to be grateful and enjoy what you have. And you don't have to have a lot to enjoy it. Just enjoy what you have. You need to ask yourself, like, what am I not enjoying right now? What am I not appreciating and enjoying that God has given me right now? We get into this mentality that I call the what or the when then mentality. You know, when this happens, then I'll be happy. When this happens, then I'll be content. You know, when I when I find a boyfriend, then I'll be happy. When I when I get married, then I'll be happy. Or when I when I get that promotion, then I'll be happy. When I make this much money, then I'll finally arrive and, and be content. Or when I start having kids, then I'll, I'll finally be content. Or when my kids will get out of my house and move already, then I'll finally be content. And it's always something more. It's always when and then. We get trapped in this when and then. And listen, you're as happy as you choose to be. Happiness is a choice if you're not happy now. Listen, if you're not happy now, you're not going to be happy then. Because happiness is a choice, and and money is a tool to be used. Money cannot make you happy. See, what you do with it, as you use it as a tool, what you do with it can make you happy or not. We always think, well, I don't have enough. I just don't have enough. Well, there's two ways for you to have enough, to to kind of solve that problem that you have. If If you're here today, oh, I just don't have enough. There's two ways. There's two options, okay? You want them? Here they are. Either work more or want less. That's it. You don't have enough? I give you two options. Work harder, work more, keep running the rat race, more, 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 and produce the damaging effects in your life and in your kids and in your future, or just be content. Just be content. This is the law of contentment. I need to enjoy what I have. Did you know that God wants you to enjoy life? God wants you to enjoy, he doesn't want you just to endure life. Like, God wants you to enjoy it. Like, he loves blessing you and providing for you and watching you enjoy the stuff that he's blessed you with parents understand this right we get our kids things and then and then and then when they're enjoying what we have given them it just produces just some joy and peace and just just in our life and really it does let's look what the bible says in first timothy chapter six about god uh he says command those who are rich in this present world we found out last week that that's every single person here okay that in america you are in the top two to three percent of the world of wealthy you are of the wealthiest humans, 2 to 3%, okay? Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but put their hope in God. Look at this, who richly provides us everything for our enjoyment. That's the kind of God we have. Man, he just, he, he wants us to enjoy life. It's for our enjoyment, but here's the problem. We're so busy getting more, we don't enjoy what we have. We're so busy getting more, we don't enjoy what God has already given us. Look what he says. He says, command them to do good and to be rich in good deeds and to be generous and willing to share. I get the question sometimes, uh, 
Like, so it goes something like this. You know, can someone be rich and not mater- materialistic? Can someone be very well off, very wealthy, and, and not be materialistic? You know, absolutely. Yes, you can. Absolutely. If you meet the four prerequisites of 1 Timothy chapter 6. This is it? Okay. Do you, do you want God? This is what God is looking for to either bless you or to keep his blessing on you. These four prerequisites of 1 Timothy chapter, what does he say? Look at it. He says, one, don't be arrogant. Oh, okay, don't, don't you start thinking you're better than them because you have more and they have less and they're of less value, less importance. Don't, don't be arrogant. That's number one. Then he says, look, don't you start putting your hope in wealth. No, don't you start putting trust in your security where it comes from, your safety net and blanket. No, he says, number three, here's the third prerequisite. He said, make sure you put your hope in God. He is the one who provides you. He is your provider of everything. It's all his. And then the fourth thing he says, the fourth prerequisite he said is, be good and generous, all right? So, so this is what God is looking at as either a prerequisite to, to, uh, to making you uh, wealthy or blessed or to keep his blessing on your life. Don't be arrogant. Don't put your hope in wealth. Put your hope in God and do good and be generous. These are just, these are just the secrets of contentment, you guys. I really want you to invite God's way into your life in this area i'm talking i mean every area i know we're isolating this one right here but this area i want you to be be bold and stop stiff arming god and thinking he's gonna he just wants to take he doesn't want to take anything from you he doesn't need anything from you he wants to bless you his ways work the secret of contentment here's the third secret of contentment that is that we need to remember that life is not about things life is not about things i've got to maintain the proper perspective about possessions or else i'll be possessed by them i got to realize that none of this is going to last otherwise i'll I'll just be dissatisfied discontent my entire life look what luke says jesus says this in luke chapter 12 verse 15 he said watch out and guard yourselves from every kind of greed because your true life is not made up of the things you own no matter how rich you may be. Life is not about acquisition. Life is not about achievement. Listen, life is about relationships. That's what life is about. Learning how to love, learning how to love God and love other people. That's what life's about. And everybody, everybody knows the prayer of Jabez, right? Oh God, enlarge my borders. Everyone knows that prayer, but few people know the prayer of Agur. That's in Proverbs chapter 30. It's just as important. Look what it says, Proverbs 30, 7 through 9. Agur writes, Oh God, I ask two things from you before I die. First, help me never to tell a lie. Second, give me neither poverty nor riches. Give me just enough to satisfy my needs. For if I grow rich, I may deny you and say, Who is the Lord? And if I'm poor, I may steal and thus insult God's holy name. This is what I call a healthy, balanced perspective on wealth. Most people are willing to pray that first half of this prayer God, don't make me poor. Don't, God, please, don't make me poor. We all pray that one, but God, don't make me poor. But are you willing to pray the other half? Okay, God, don't, don't make me too rich. Either extremes can cause you to forget God. Wealth can make you prideful and say, who needs God? And poverty can make you bitter. I need to remember that my life is not about things. The secrets to contentment. Here's the fourth secret that we need to learn, and that is we have to focus on what will last forever to focus on what will last forever. I give my attention to permanent values. I give my my attention to permanent things and eternal priorities. I focus on what will last forever. And nothing you see here will last forever. It's going to rust out, wear out, decay. Every possession is temporary. So I shouldn't make my life about acquiring possessions, possessing possessions, This building itself will one day decay, rust, fall over. The trees you see will one day fall, will will be no more. The Bible actually says that that there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. Like everything is going to vanish. Everything's going away. Only two things will last forever. Two things, the word of God and people. Those are the only two things that are eternal. The word of God and people. The Bible says heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word will remain forever. It will never pass away. That's why you need to be in your word every 
day because God's word is truth. It is your anchor amongst all the lies and the deceit and the fading and the passing and the vapors all around you. You need to anchor your life on the word of God. It is truth. It is eternal. And the only other thing that is eternal is people. You need to make your life about investing not for people, not for more, or not for things and possessions, but invest your lives to make a difference for people. That's why we even launched the Dream Center here in our city, because God has blessed us so that we can be a blessing. And while we're here on this earth, we're going to make a difference in people's lives. Can I get an amen? amen? Invest our lives in people, building relationships. 2 Corinthians 4, 18 says, We fix our attention. Not on the things that are seen, but on the things that are unseen. What can be seen lasts only for a time, but what cannot be seen lasts forever. So you got to decide, am, am I going to build my life on the acquisition of things or relationships with people? Am I going to focus on people or possessions? Am I going to focus on riches or relationships? There was a famous millionaire, a woman who lived in Southern California. Years ago, she passed away, but she was widowed, didn't have you know, any extended family or relationship. She passed away and someone at the funeral said, man, she, why, they didn't get it. Like, because she committed suicide. She actually ended her life. And so it confused a lot of people at the funeral. said, man, she had so much to live for. One guy said, no, 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 she didn't. She had, she had so much to live on. She had nothing to live for. And so you may have today a lot to live on, but do you have anything to live for? Do you have a relationship with God? I invite you today, I challenge you to get off the rat race, to get off that wheel of always desiring more and more and adopt God's value system. Invite God's ways into your life, this myth of the world that you can have all you want and it's actually going to make you happy is not true. You cannot have all that you want. And actually, uh, it's not going to make you happy. Here's good news. The good news is you don't need it to be happy. You don't. You're as happy as you choose to be. The secret to contentment, if you don't get anything else out of today, get this. The secret of contentment is finding myself. It's finding my security and my satisfaction, not in things, not in what I have, but in whose I am, who I belong to. I find it in Christ. That's the secret of contentment. Not in your notes, up here on the screen, Psalm 17 and 15. I, I just, I, will you receive this today and make this, last week we ended with a declaration and this may be your declaration today. The secret of contentment, this guy has it down. He says, but as for me, my contentment is not in wealth. See, my contentment is not in this world. It's not in things. It's not in treasures. It's not in possessions. Man, I can see other people in the race that they're running, but I'm on a different race. As for me, my contentment from this day forward is not in wealth, but God, it's in seeing you and knowing that all is well in our relationship, God. And when I awake in heaven there I'll be fully satisfied, for I will see you face to face. See, I'm running a different race. I'm not on the same track as this world. They're pursuit of more, and they're thinking that that's what's going to get them satisfied. I'm on, a, I'm on a different field and track entirely. I have a different goal, a different aim, a different prize. My goal is to stand before my God, relationship whole and at peace, and be fully satisfied face to face with my God and King. That's my goal. But as for me, my contentment is not in wealth. It's in seeing you, God. Come on, let's bow our heads right there. I want you to make that your your declaration today. Maybe today you're here and you're already seeing the damaging effects of wanting more, the damaging effects of, of just being on that race and that wheel that culture has you on, of just more and more and greater and greater. It's not enough. It's not enough. And you're already seeing the damaging effects and maybe you're seeing the anxiety. Maybe you're carrying it or maybe it's producing anxiety in your family somewhere or Maybe you're seeing conflict and turmoil and you thought like it was actually going to make it better. The more it was going to make it better and alleviate some, but it, 
but something got off and it's actually creating more conflict and even more disappointment and dissatisfaction like it didn't do what you thought it would do because it listen it was never intended to do what you thought it would do it was never intended to satisfy your soul but today maybe you're here and you want to get off that race you want to you want to get on this different track and declare as for me my contentment is not in wealth that i'm gonna apply the secrets and learn the secrets of contentment in my life maybe you're here today and you're ready for a change maybe you're here today and and what the psalmist prayed where he said as for me i just want to know that all is well between me and my god and maybe you're here today and maybe you can't really say that today with confidence that all is well between you and god and today, maybe you're sensing God just call you, beckon to you. Can I tell you that He loves you so much? He loves you so much. He loves you just the way you are and where you are. The Bible says that God has already even made a way for that relationship with, with Him to be well, to be right. Like, and it has nothing to do with what you've done or going to do. It has everything to do with what Jesus has already done. He accomplished it on the cross. Jesus Christ bore your sins upon himself. You couldn't pay for them yourself. You can't forgive yourself. But because of what Jesus did, your sins are forgiven. The Bible says that all you need to do is confess that Jesus Christ is your Lord, your Savior, and you'll be saved. Romans chapter 10 says that if, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You, that, it'll be well between you and God. And maybe today you're ready for that. You want that. You're, maybe today you're yearning for that. And I want to pray with you. I want to pray a simple prayer right with your seat. I'm not going to have you come up to the front, not make it awkward or anything. I just, I want to pray this prayer of surrender, a prayer of salvation, a prayer of accepting Jesus today as the Lord, like the controller, the give him, give him the control of your life. Make him your Lord. So with every head bowed and eye closed, if that's you and you're ready to like make a change and invite Jesus in, with every head bowed and eye closed, I'm not going to have you come to the front, but I want to pray a prayer. I want to help you with some words to make this a very special, maybe the most important day of your life. If you're ready for that, do me a favor. Slip up your hand, lift it high, say, Pastor, will you pray for me? Amen. Yeah, yeah, leave it up. Yeah, amen, 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 amen. Yeah, 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 yes, yes, amen. Yeah, in the back, yes. Amen. Praise God. Hands all over the place. Yes. Go ahead and put them down for just a moment. Yeah. Put them down. Pray this prayer like this. Just say, God, forgive me. Will you just whisper it? Jesus. There's power in his name. Just say it. Jesus, I need you. Forgive me, God, for my sins. Today, Jesus, I give you the control of my life. I surrender. I declare you are my Lord. Will you just tell him that? You are my Lord, and I give my life to you. Come live inside of me and take over, take control, change me, rearrange me, God. Help me to live for you and not for me, not for this world, that, that my satisfaction and contentment would not come from anything that this world has to offer, but that it would come from my relationship with you. God, and I speak that over every person that may have some of these damaging effects already produced in their life, that today, God, we're making a change in Jesus' name. This is our declaration that we will no longer be contented and find our contentment in this world or in wealth, but we're going to find it in you and knowing you, God. That the race that we're running is different. I'm running a different race. I'm running for a different prize. I'm going a different direction, God. Help me to live for you. God, we invite your way into our life, that we would learn the secrets of contentment. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come on, give God some praise if you receive that today, amen.